Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to our event, Peace Activists Report Back from China. Uh, I am very, very honored to share uh, this panel with Julie Tong, uh, former judge and co-founder of Pivot to Peace, a very, very uh, important anti-war organization, as well as Michael Wong, the co-coordinator of Veterans for Peace China Working Group. Uh, both Michael and Julie are amazing members of our team at China is Not Our Enemy and have lots of insight and a wealth of experience that they give to help us really shine a light on the problems and the issues facing uh, war and peace when it comes to China and the United States, how it affects uh, Asian Americans, the impact it has on uh, people in the Asia Pacific region, people and the impact it has on people in China. Recently, President Xi Jinping and Joe Biden actually had a summit in San Francisco, and they, you know, reached some consensus. Although there was uh, some escalation as well, but we had uh, some progress when it came to the increase of direct flights to China which allows more Americans to go to China and see what it's actually like and to find out what exactly is happening in the country. And Julie and Michael did just that, recently going on uh, a, a, a several weeks long trip to the People's Republic of China. And I'm so glad to be joined by both Julie and Michael. Thanks, both of you. Thank you, Keo. It's such a pleasure to be here. Whenever I'm on Coping's program, I, I feel like I'm I'm with family. <laughs> thank you. Yes, That's thank great. you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to us to uh, just kind of talk about um, the main uh, kind of uh, reasons you decided to go to China, what you saw. And, you know, also what are the key takeaways um, from your visit to China? Uh, I want to first show a map of the places that you visited um, over your time. I wanted to include some more of the cities that you traveled to, but here you can see uh, a map of Southeastern China, as well as some of the uh, provinces and cities in autonomous regions that both of you visited. So yeah, why don't y'all take it away and kind of share your journey and your itinerary. Kale, what a beautiful map you put out. I just love it. I love the pink background and the pink colors over the city that we visited. It is so cold pink. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that map shows uh, the journey that, uh, that we took, but we actually took different journeys. China for four weeks to Easter. And we were just vacationing, relaxing, you know, lay back. And then in the last two weeks, I was joined up with Michael and his entourage. And we'll get a chance to talk about the purpose of that visit and what we did uh, with the group. But I visited um, the, the cities that you identified, the, the provinces that you identified here. But the reason why I go went back, went to China is because I said Chinese American, it's got so much excitement for me. It's uh, my culture, you know, my language, and and all the things that happen in China are so exciting. And if we don't go back, uh, Chinese or non-Chinese, it will be such a such a loss. And having been born in Hong Kong and raised there, uh, this is also a holiday visit. For a long time after I left Hong Kong in 1967. I didn't care to go back at all. And in fact, I don't think I went back for like 10 years until at some point I decided, well, I just go back and take a look, you know? And even then it was not with a whole lot of emotional attachment. I'm beginning to become more emotionally attached and to China. And maybe because I've learned so much more having lived in America, having been away and comparing my experience in both countries, I get to really if, uh, value uh, value and appreciate China and Hong Kong even more. I uh, visited uh, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Guangzhou, 
in Hainan Island, Shanghai, Hangzhou. And you can see that I went from the tip, you know, of China all the way to, as you said, the northeastern part. Each city is different and distinguished from the other by geography, by landscape, climate, people, culture, and dialect spoken. But they can all communicate with each other with one common language, and that is the uh, Putonghua, and, uh, or you call it Mandarin. And they all read the same writing. But the more important common aspect that I have learned among the people in China is that they have uh, something that we don't have, or not at least by the same degree, and is safety, and safety and efficiency. I want to um, just go, can I just go into a little bit of that, or should I just um, uh, give it back to you, Kao, at this time? Well, yeah, I'd love to talk. Okay, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll continue on with it then. Yes. On the safety issue, you know, it's a country that you don't have to, everywhere you go, and I've been to eight cities, <laughs> and, and it was not like I was led by tour guides, you know, who only show me certain part of China that is safe and shield me from, you know, homeless or whatever. I went everywhere on my own with friends uh, in China and relatives in China. In 2019, I lived in China for about two weeks at a at my relative's home. We went everywhere, went to markets, back alleys, and everywhere that she went, I followed her. And it's all the same, it is safe. And for that, I, I think that it is something that we can learn from China, learn about how they run their system. And it's something that I also tell you. In San Francisco, um, is, San Francisco is one of the three cities that suffered the most during the pandemic from anti-Asian hate. So you can understand the, the, uh, how relaxed I am instantly when I was in China, where I didn't have to worry about that, first of all. And then I to worry about me and assaulting me and also robbing me. Uh, all those things are just gone. I, I don't worry about people carrying guns because they don't allow guns in China. And people were extremely friendly. And I, so I looked up some of the, um, the, the, the crime rates in China, and I found out that um, China, um, uh, for example, their homicide rate is about one-tenth of the global average. And, um, and in the last two decades, China has, um, uh, has really um, cleaned up uh, the country. And their murder rate is 80% down from two decades ago. And during the same period, robbery also fell by 97% and assault by 40%. And in terms of the violent crime rates, and these are statistics from the court, that they handled in 2021 49,000 violent crimes. And this violent crime rate is equivalent to 3.47%. Um, percent, um, uh, 3.47 violent crimes for every 100,000 people living in China. Now, I know I, I read about the stats and then I also read some more. And there people uh, say, oh, that's lie. You know, China's always lying about everything. You know, these crime rates don't, don't trust them. It's all fake. Well, you know, I was in China. I feel absolutely safe. So there is a correlation with how I felt what the experiences of China state represent me. Uh, so these, uh, these statistics, uh, I don't have any way of uh, verifying these statistics, but the fact that we were so safe in China and there were individuals in China who live in China and has some dispute with me, you know, they, there's some things about this they didn't care for. But when I talk about safety, they all said, yeah, safety is our greatest asset here. They couldn't deny that. So um, the homeless people were treated very well. I saw three homeless people in the in the eight six weeks out there, and there was two in Hong Kong and one in Guangzhou. They were treated well. I mean, nobody were afraid of them. They were just left alone. And in Hong Kong, in one instance, um, a homeless man came into the restaurant that I was having breakfast with my sister, and he asked to buy some uh, white porridge. And she was put there. And the restaurant took his money and gave him some white porridge and he said thank you and he left. So the homeless people were sort of integrated into the community quite well. 
And in another instance in Hong Kong, when I uh, at very very late at night, I left um I left my service. And I was walking back to the hotel and I got a little lost and I saw a man. And so I just asked him, I said, oh, could you give me the direction? And he gave me the direction very clearly. And I thank him. And I turned around and he was living in a camper. So that was the second homeless person. I met him. Otherwise, um, and the third person, the homeless person I met in Guangzhou was a woman, older woman who was, who was standing there in the middle of a touristy area. Some girls saw saw her saw her and just sat down right next to her and continued that conversation. I really think there's so much respect for human beings and in in China, people that I met um very compassionate about people, and uh, it's a very changed society from many years when I was there when they were, you know, um, fighting poverty when people were poor. But after China. For 850 million people, you really can see a stark difference in people's attitude about for towards themselves and towards others. They're more relaxed, especially the young people. They're very confident in who they are. And it was that they love their country. And I am just so proud of these young people who are growing up in peace times. And, and they all really appreciate what they have. Now China has not invaded any country for the last 75 years. Has not started wars, and they were they might have been engaged in two uh, disputes. I think with India over border issues, and there's border skirmishes, and then they also uh, had um, they fought in Vietnam and Korea to protect the sovereignty of these countries. I am, you know, coming from a very warm, mongering country like like America, it's a very different feel. How people treat you, how people respect you, and um, and I would say that, that for everywhere that I went, in particular the villages, that are remote areas, that I went into, were even kinder. Those people would just open up their house for you, invite you into their house, pour you a cup of tea with no issues at all. So um, my trip was very worthwhile for me because I really enjoyed it. And, um, and yet the second thing that I really appreciate being in China was the use of digital currency. Everyone in China had a, I had a phone, a mobile phone, where they can use to pay for anything that they, um, that they want to purchase. I, I learned how to do that by reading up a menu and installing uh, a credit card into uh, the WeChat that I have. And I was a little nervous. I didn't know whether, whether it would work. I took it to China. Bang, it worked. You know, I was spending 70% of my purchases uh, using my, my iPhone. But the 30%, for some reason, it didn't work. I, I suspect it was the Wi-Fi or maybe my US provider didn't exactly click, you know, with the American uh, China system. But it was such a nice thing. My cousin, who lives in Guangzhou, who, who stayed with me in, during the entire time that I was in Guangzhou, told me one of the reasons why she loved it, not just because of the efficiency, but the fact that you don't, you don't have to touch the money. She said, money is so dirty, I don't want to touch it. And here we just use our iPhone and we pay for everything. So the digital currency was another real, real, um, good experience. And um, I didn't see any sign of poverty anywhere. I do see poor people. There's no question. Because in China, there's still a lot of people working in very difficult labor jobs. Um, I see it in the mornings and noontime and in the evening. Uh, thousands of um, pe uh, young, young men and women riding their motorcycles, delivering food. And they work very hard. Chinese people are very industrious people. They work really, really hard. And they pride themselves and they don't want it, want it any other way. They, mm -hmm. they, they hate being idle. They think it is a disgrace to themselves and to the family. And not to say that you know, I you that I'm sure you know, you know, folks like that. But the majority of the people are proud and, and they just really want to work hard and they strive for a better society. And the main thing that they know that they have to do that. They understand the issues of the US-China Cold War. They are very on board 
they are very up to uh, up to par on all the things that are going on, and they can tell you more than what you want to know. And that's why they felt they have to work even harder to make themselves self sufficient, and they do not want to work. They want peace. So I would at this time give it back to you, Kale. I've, I've said a lot, and and I don't want to take up too much time from Michael either. Not at all. I feel like what you you said a lot of very um uh interesting things that people often you know probably uh don't consider when thinking about uh topics like poverty alleviation or um uh you know the digital um economy that exists in China. Uh, and that seems like such an awesome set of cities. I want to kind of come back to what you did on the on the trail <laughs> that you that you set for yourself. But Michael, I want to uh, kind of pivot to you. Can you kind of uh, take us through uh, some of you know your experience? You know, you started in Hong Kong. Is that right? Yes. Uh, why don't you show the pictures that I uh, I, I sent you? Um, uh, Let's see, actually, this is uh, part of, of Hong Kong. It's a park, and it's run by a Buddhist uh, association. Um, and it's very interesting because you can see the difference between the old traditional uh, culture in the, the park, you know, the, uh, the buildings, the pond, and then you see the high-rise uh, buildings in the background, and you see the mountains behind them. So that's how when you visit China, you see the blend of the ancient and the modern together. Um, why don't we go to the next picture? No. Okay, well, while we're going to the next picture, I'll just mention a little incident about safety that actually happened in America. Uh, Julie was talking about how safe China is. I had a friend that uh, is originally from China, and she went back and spent several months in China and then came back to the United States uh, just recently. First thing she did, she's walking down the street holding her phone in her hand, and somebody grabs it and runs off with it, steals her phone, because what happened was she got so used to being safe in China, she forgot her old American habits of protecting yourself when you're here. Um, so this picture is uh, the, uh, the harbor in uh, Hong Kong. You can see the buildings and the, the mountains in the background. That junk that's uh, very nicely decorated that you see in front of you, that's actually an advertisement for a bank. So <laughs> this is like, you know, traditional, traditional culture combined with modern uh, advertising. Um, <laughs> Can we go to the next picture? Yes. Can you see it? <coughs> <coughs> yes, there's just the junk that I was talking about. Uh, let's go to the next picture after that. <coughs> Sorry, my allergies are acting up. So this is a little uh, fishing village, Tai O, um, that, uh, oops, sorry, skip back to the fishing village. Oh, there's, there's some kind of delay. Uh, do you, is the fishing village on your screen now, Michael? <laughs> no, there's the uh, Hangzhou. Uh, yeah, okay, this is it. Good, good. So anyway, this is an old fishing village. It's become a tourist attraction in addition to doing fishing. Uh, we took a little boat tour around it and you can see the old buildings. And when you talk about poverty in China, what China has done is they've eliminated extreme poverty. You know, back in the old days, people, you know, lived out in the countryside. There was no central heating, no electricity, no running water, um, you know, and they had, uh, you know, they had ancient wood stoves that they used. Uh, everything was, was, you know, ancient technology. What they've done is they've lifted people out of that extreme poverty. Their next step is to uh, deal with mo what, what they call moderate poverty. This is what you see here. You see, you see these old buildings that people are living in. 
they have electricity, they have running water, they have heat, they have, you know, the modern conveniences, people walking around with cell phones, um, you know, they have computers and all that, but they're still living in, in old housing. Some of these places, they're housed, but, you know, they're small. Um, and so this is the next step in, in China's evolution that the government wants to work on is to bring everybody from, you know, they've gotten everybody out of extreme poverty. Now the next stop, step is to get everybody out of moderate poverty. Um, but, you know, as you can see, you know, it's, it's a process um, and they're making progress on that. Okay, let's go. Yeah, this is good. So this is the uh, Guangzhou uh, high-speed rail train station. And it really struck me because this was the first time that I've been back to uh, Guangzhou, which is the capital of Guangdong province. Guangdong province is where uh, most of uh, the uh, Chinese came from in the old days, uh, during the gold rush and up until probably the 1960s, most Chinese came from small villages in Guangdong province. And at that time, China was very poor. It was being chopped up into colonies by the Western colonial powers, America among them. Um, and, you know, people, <coughs> sorry, people live very uh, dangerous uh, lives in a war, in, in a war torn environment. Um, the life expectancy, the average was 38 at that time. And I realized my family came from uh, Guangdong province from a small village a hundred years ago, a century ago. My grandparents came, third generation Chinese American. My grandparents were born and raised during the Qing dynasty, the last imperial dynasty of China. And to go back now, this is the first time that any member of my family has ever been back to Guangdong province where our ancestors came from. And to walk, to arrive there and walk into this modern train station, I mean, you just look at it. It's like, it's more modern than, than the train station that we have in San Francisco, you know? Um, and to see the progress that China has made, that was a very emotional moment for me to realize that, you know, after a hundred years, a member of my family finally came back and this is what China looks like today. So uh, let's go to the next picture. Okay, so this is a boat ride up the Pearl River. And, um, and you can see the modern buildings. Uh, you know, if you were to take a ride through San Francisco, I mean, this, you wouldn't see this kind of view. Um, okay, this is actually skipping ahead. This is Shanghai. Um, and this is a view from my hotel. Uh, and you can see in the foreground, the, the old uh, colonial era buildings that were built by the Europeans during the colonial period. And then in the background, you can see the high rise uh, buildings that have built, been built in the modern period in China. Uh, so that gives you some idea of, you know, the old and the new. Okay, this goes back to Guangzhou again. Um, okay. Oh, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. You had a question? Oh, no, uh, I, 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 there's an unfortunate lag, so I, I'm trying to keep up as well. Are you seeing the, the Guangzhou skyline on your screen? Uh, no, we're looking at Shanghai now. But Shanghai. why don't we just stay here? This is fine. Um, so wait, wait. But this is the last, it's, it's, it's the nighttime skyline, right? Yeah, this is Guangzhou. This is the Pearl River, the boat yes. ride up the Pearl River. Right. Um, it was, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's very beautiful. It's very modern. Um, there's some older sections in each of these cities. You know, each of these cities, you see modern sections and then you see older sections. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, bland and kind of diversity of of scenes uh, anywhere in, in China that you go. Um, okay, yeah, let's go to, go ahead to the next one. Absolutely. Is this, so I, this is um, Hangzhou, I believe, is that right? Yes, that's correct. 
And then the next one is Shanghai. Yeah, there were two pictures in, in Hangzhou. One was the train station and then this one. Oh, okay. So you skipped a couple of pages ahead. Uh, that's fine. Uh, so, you know, back when the communists first came to power in 1949, one of the things that they did was they made people equal. And that means, uh, you know, there were very rich people that lost their properties. Uh, whoops, uh, you're going too fast. Let's go back. Oh, well, my apologies. It's, it should be back on the screen now. After, is, is that correct? Uh, no, go one, one back. One, one more back. Okay. Okay, so back in the in the when the communists first came to power, you know, they made everybody equal, which means a lot of very, very rich people lost, you know, their properties. This is one of those properties. Um, this is a former rich man's estate. Uh, I think this is in Shanghai. Uh, it's either in Shanghai or uh, the next city that we visited. But uh, this is just a, one small view of his home. estate it's it's many acres uh big it's uh just as you see very classical chinese very beautiful and basically it's been made into a park uh kind of a park museum of uh for for chinese now that it, anybody can go there and and enjoy it um and so and, and also it shows the contrast between the rich and the poor in ancient china um so this is that that's what this is and that's uh, the ancient architecture that you can see that's very beautiful okay let's go on to the next picture by the way i wanted to ask like when you were um traveling uh especially when you were going to you know shanghai and Hangzhou and places like that did you get like a you know understanding of uh what was like the class dynamics of a lot of these cities um you know in the areas that you visited What, say the question again. What was the class dynamic of the cities that you visited in the the class that dynamic? You... Yes. Uh, you know, we saw people interacting quite freely. <coughs> the class dynamic. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> class dynamic didn't stand out strongly, in in my observation. Um, you know, when we were in that small fishing village, you could definitely see the difference between the Chinese tourists who were all well-dressed and some of the uh, Chinese fishermen and working people who were, you know, wearing work clothes, basically. Um, but they, they interacted freely. They certainly could all speak the same language. Um, I didn't notice, like, you know, any snobbery or anything like that. Um, and then in the, uh, when we went elsewhere, like here, this is uh, the water city. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Uh, I think Julie can tell me. Um, she was there actually. This is the, um, this is Hangzhou. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so, it's the capital of province. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, uh, Yeah, people interacted very freely. Um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Hang on, maybe Julie can talk about this picture. <coughs> yeah, what I what I would like to do is to address your question about the class dynamics. It's a very good question uh, because um, China had been very, very poor for the longest time. And um, the wealth had always been concentrated in a small group. And 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 it is still like that in a little in, in some ways. All right, it is not entirely um, all equal. But I can say that everybody has food, and that's important for China. And a lot I know a lot of Americans said, "What? Everybody has food, and that's important." Well, you know, we take that for granted. But I know that I can. I still talk to people today. People my age who have no food to eat during um, during uh, during the fifties. Um, and during the 60s in China. And also there's a difference between those who live in the farm and in the villages and those who live in the big cities like Shanghai, Guangzhou. They, they, they are, and there are the owners, maybe uh, owners of operations, or, or they work in high-tech companies. 
there is a difference. But and I think that's what China is trying to do now, is to lift up everybody. And they've already lifted up like three, four hundred thousand, uh, three hundred, three, four hundred um, uh, millions of, of people into a very solid middle class uh, who has similar um, enjoyment as the Western people do in uh, in the Western countries. But there are still many of them who are still very poor. They work uh, very hard labor. They carry bricks. They carry big, long pipes up the hill. Um, and they do so much labor work. And um, uh, and China is also divided into first line city, second line city. Uh, so the first, first line cities uh, are Shanghai, Guangzhou, Beijing. Uh, the second line cities are uh, cities like um, uh, Guilin, uh, Hongzhou. But in the third tier, city, I guess the first, first, second, and third tier cities, uh, like Shanxi, and where they are still very poor, but everybody still, they have food to eat, they have a roof over their head, they have good medical services, uh, and, and, and that's where the, the difference is really where you live and the degree of luxury that you have. And, and China is striving to make that equal and bring back, bring up the rest of the, uh, of the Chinese citizens. And that's why they're working so hard. And that's why China wants uh, peace. If they're at war, they cannot lift the rest of the people up to a standard that uh, we in the West can enjoy and, and that a large group of Chinese now uh, do enjoy. Uh, and they really wanted to um, provide that for the country. And, and I think that the people know and work that with their leadership to happen. And many of them said, we don't mind working as hard as we do because we know our country is progressing. We're doing good things. And look, and then they'll brag about their IT system, you know, their, their, their Huawei phones and their high rails. And they said, we have these things now and we're going to get more. And that's why China do not want war. And all these ridiculous uh, comments about China's being aggressive, China wants to grow war. No, China and the Chinese people absolutely do not want war. We are the ones who want war. We are the war mongers here. Why? Because we have to be number one. And we have to be the hegemon. In order to be that hegemon and number one, we will go to war. And today I just read that there was um, uh, some kind of an aircraft that that felt that dropped in a, in a, in a, in a um, southeastern, southwestern part of Japan. And there's American military aircraft. This is 16 times that that kind of aircraft has um, got into accident. I think one person died and five, five military, American military, uh, they could not found him. They're probably dead. Uh, why, what are they doing over there? Come on, we just have Chinese people over here in America flying aircrafts and and drowning the planes and 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 um, Chinese people dying because of that but we have a lot of Americans dying right now uh, because they are in the military and they're fighting for a very, very warmongering country who is now trying to kick up a war in in Taiwan and they know it they don't want it and the leaders keep trying to push back hold up and a lot of the Chinese people are complaining and say why are the president so weak and not, you know, just kind of prove that we are powerful too. No, you know, patience, restraint is what they practice. And it's, it's true that they said that the Chinese, they practice Tai Chi, you know. Tai Chi is a very slow moving exercise. You push, you pull, and then you use that kind of round circle energy to create yourself. And also not put, push the enemy um, to a, a very extreme. But American, they do boxing, bang, bang, bang. You know, all they want is just punch, you know, and then do a, a punch the person and 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 have a win for all. So that's the difference from what I see having lived in America for so long and went back to China and talked to the people, understand the culture, understand that people might know what they're thinking. I mean, they have so many things that we don't have that they can be proud of. Michael was talking about the high-speed rail. China has two hundred uh, has twenty six thousand one hundred miles of uh, high speed rail. That you anywhere you live in China, you can take the subway and you can hop on a subway within hours. 
Uh, we cannot do that here. We have to buy plane tickets, okay, to fly to Los Angeles. And in China, within that distance, they could be there in an, an hour, you know, two hours, because their their railways, uh, their 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 trains can go as fast as 186 to 217 17 miles per hour. In the United States, we have one passenger that goes 375 miles, and that is in Orlando, okay. And that they can go up to, I think, um, uh, 100, uh, 100 miles per hour. But uh, where, why, why are we spending our money in infrastructure on everything else and, you know, supplying arms to, to Ukraine, supplying arms to Israel uh, in that war that they're fighting? And why aren't we spending our money right here in San Francisco or in, in America? It is a shame, and it is a is is really not fair to us consumers, uh, and people are, are just not complaining <laughs> enough. If that happens, you're going to be complaining, and these people will be taking the issue onto the streets. A lot of people say that Chinese people are not complaining, and they are because it's authoritarian and this and that. But did you know that almost every day there's a protest going on in China about something in the locality? There could be two people protesting or five people protesting. And these public officials are scared to death whenever these China, whenever the citizens are like, because they are worried. I met I, one of the lady who gave me a foot massage. I was talking to her. She moved from the village into the city uh, because, she could, because she was able to rent out uh, her farmland and collect a small amount of money. And now she can get a higher paid job by renting a place where she can do massage with her and her family lives in the back. And so I was testing her, I was pushing her button and I said, okay, you said you're so free and she, 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 she was telling me how proud she is and the freedom and this and that and said, what are you gonna do if you have a, a complaint about, about what's happening to you in your district? So, well, I said, there's, there's, and she said, there's a place down this, in the road from where we where we live, and there's a big sign that says, complaints accepted. <laughs> and she said, go in, and I can file a complaint. And ,他们倒霉了. in Chinese, that means they're in big trouble. ,他们倒霉. means in big trouble. Then I said, well, I said, what if you have a problem with President Xi Jinping? What are you going to do? You cannot go up to him and complain, and then he's not going to be Taomei. He should be I want to thank him if I see him. I want to tell him how much I appreciate what he's doing for the country. I said, oh, sorry. You know, okay. I'm not going to fight her on that. So this is how the Chinese people feel. About 90% of the Chinese people really love their government. I don't know what's the percentage of our country who appreciates our government. I don't think it's that high. Um, I, I see that. Also, at high-speed rail is so efficient. First of all, you have to be there 20 minutes before the train, you know, takes off. So about 20 minutes before the point of time, then you have to line up, okay? And then when you got there, all this way about like, people lined up or whatever number of people the train can allow. And then within like five, 10 minutes, everybody's gone because they have this ID card and all they have to do is slip it in and boom, they're gone and they're gone. Now, foreigners like ourselves, we have a different different um, uh, track system because we don't have those Hong, uh, Chinese identity cards. So it checks in mentally, but it was fast because unfortunately there are just not too many tourists in China right now. I saw only two Americans in the re eight weeks that I was there. I saw three homeless and two Americans. Okay, I don't know what that means, but the Americans were there because their friends there or their or their family was working in China, and um and. And the tourism, they really need tourism in China. So people who are in this program, if you want to go anywhere, you know, go to China, help them out a little bit. They, the people love to see Americans. They don't hate Americans. They just want to get war with us. They, they don't like our, our, our policies that ban them and sanction them and do not allow them to buy chips for their um, machinery and electronics and do not allow uh, Americans to invest in America and, and, and put us in the companies on the list for no reason at all. They, they love Americans. And when they, they when they meet Americans, they would say, oh, tell us about America and this and that. And they really wanted to be uh, friendly to us. And um, and they always said that the, the get the, the tourists are the most Americans. Because they're friendly, they're open, they always ask us questions. And they give good tips and say, oh, oh, that's good, you know. And I'm talking about the tour guides. 
ordinary restaurants, they, they refused to take tips. Um, we the, the second half of our trip was to um, Anjing uh, Museum. And what we did there was to, it was that we were officially invited by the Nanjing Museum and uh, to um, participate in a program called Eternal Testimony. The program is a, um, is a AI powered um, uh, virtual uh, program where you can actually talk and have a conversation with a comfort woman uh, survivor. And, um, and we spent five years working on that project partner up with the museum and also the Shoal Foundation uh, at USC and also a Korean American community, the Kim Foundation. It was a five year endeavor. It's a lot of work and we spent two weeks or maybe just one week uh, taping uh, Comfort Woman Survivor Pang Nai Nai and ask her like 500 questions. And all the questions were recorded so that when you put it on the um, screen and you turn on the machine, and you can actually have a conversation with her. For example, you can ask her, how are you? And she'll say, I'm fine, of course, in Chinese, but we are gonna put subtitles there in English. Or we can say that, um, uh, um, Kao, can you uh, uh, scroll down to the last picture? The last, um, where uh, okay, it shows. Yes. The last picture. Yeah, the, no, not this one. The last, go to the last, the bottom. Yeah, go to the, one more, one more. This is Nanjing. Oh, this is oh, the Nanjing no, you don't have right. the picture. No, you don't have the picture because yeah. yeah. recording I, in progress. Yeah, the picture shows this. Yeah, hey, 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 I added some other pictures to his. I I only have these pictures. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Maybe, so this, uh, is, this is the Comfort yeah, Woman Station. Yeah, that's the Comfort Woman Station. <laughs> yeah. It maybe was, you can uh, talk about the pictures as I show them, and then you can go ahead with with the, the rest of your explanation. Yeah, this was built in um, uh, 2015 in December. And it's really interesting because this is um, an actual comfort, a woman, a comfort station during World War II. And, and later on, uh, after uh, Japan, uh, the Japanese uh, soldiers left, they, uh, they, it was just left there as a building. I don't know what they did with it. And later on, they discovered it was a comfort station and they actually had a Korean uh, comfort woman survivor came to uh, Nanjing, look at the uh, the station, and said, "Yes, this is a station I was in prison in. That I was invited this year, and she put it out. And her name is, I think, Park Park something. I, I I'm sorry, I forgot the full name, but it, it was uh, restored and, uh, uh, and into a museum and opened to the public in December 2015." And interestingly, that is the same month and the same day that we got approval from the San Francisco Board of Supervisors to, um, uh, to build the San Francisco Comfort Woman Memorial. And we've been in contact with this museum. And we, uh, last year, we also um, had a miniature Comfort Woman Memorial, San Francisco Comfort Woman Memorial donated to them. Uh, and so the, the purpose of the, our trip was to officially open up the uh, mentioned testimony program so that people can come in and, and engage in a virtual conversation with a comfort woman survivor and also to um, appreciate uh, the San Francisco Comfort Woman Memorial without being here in San Francisco. And we had a wonderful time there. Judge Lin and Singh and I led the delegation. And we also have Jennifer Chern, who is the um, president of Nanjing Redress Coalition. And Michael Wong came with us. And, uh, and Phyllis Kim, you see in the middle there, she is a Korean American uh, a woman. She's the head of the okay. She's also a, um, a member of the executive committee. The other lady with her is a Korean interpreter. They even provide a Korean um, uh, interpreter for uh, for Phyllis. And um, yeah, the lady and, on the left, uh, lady on the right, yeah. I mean. And then Judge Singh, yeah, right Lillian the Singh is on the, the, the left. Right. And the picture is of all the women who, who uh, I think they were the ones who stayed in that comfort women station. Or maybe they were just the comfort women. I, I'm not so sure. So that, that's why we were there. and. Um, and this is the little miniature uh, statue that we donated to the museum. It's a very small museum. And they are more um, 
uh, artifacts and and things um, to um, fill the museum, and they also uh, and, and also because Japan when they left China burned and destroyed most of the uh, memorabilia that we could have and burned up documents, uh, burned um, uh, just evidence of the comfort organizations. It's just but whatever they have, they put up there. And I was very proud that we were able to present that little memorial to them. And actually, we, we hide, there's another statue behind me and Lillian standing there. And that is uh, Hak Soon Kim. She was the first Comfort Woman uh, in, a survivor to come out with the story of the Comfort Woman. She's the first to tell the story. And so we honored her with her own statue. And then the three young ladies were standing there on the pedestal. That is so sweet. She was when she was that age. And the average age of the comfort women, victims were like 15 years old. Some were as young as nine years old. And uh, it is a very tragic story. Women were confined. You see the barracks behind you with the little windows. They were they were confined in those rooms. They each have a little, little tiny room. It's just enough of one single bed. And they were they all the time schools. And they were there all day. They have the breakfast, lunch, and dinner there. And all they do was to serve uh, the, the Japanese soldiers and um, uh, sexually as slaves. And they, one comfort woman uh, uh, wrote in her memoir that when the, the soldiers had their iron hours and patients to feed the post because they would line up, like, like, you know, hundreds of them. And she would serve sometimes 30 to 40 a day. Uh, their the fatality rate is very very short, and they um uh, they they died uh within like maybe two three years of imprisonment if that long, and uh, ninety percent of them perish, um with, uh, in confinement, uh, and you can imagine the treatment that they have. You know I'm very proud of what China is doing because China is remembering history, commemorating it. In fact, uh, China designated one day. Which is December thirteenth, as the I think is thirteenth as the date of the and also they they also commemorate the comfort women also. Okay, Michael, I've spoken too much. Yeah. I think it's yeah, that's uh, a, that's your turn. okay. Yeah, the, so that that statue is a miniature of the statue that we built in San Francisco to honor the comfort women uh, of World War II, and then this is a scene at the end um, of you know, a lot of the different people that were involved that were leaders of different organizations in the movement. Uh, and Michael, uh, how many of these people uh, did you, uh, you know, know going before you went to China? Or are these mostly folks you met while you were there? Uh, I know four of the people in this picture. On the far right um, is Phyllis Kim, who's uh, in Los Angeles, and she's the leader of the uh, Korean movement for the comfort women there. Um, and then there's a man who I don't know. There's Lillian Singh, a retired judge that works. Lillian and Julie work very closely together on the mm. comfort women issue and on a lot of issues, uh, you know, over, over time in the Chinese community. Uh, to the left of Julie wearing the uh, light green t-shirt uh, that's Jennifer Chung. She's also very involved in the Comfort Woman movement uh, here in San Francisco. Uh, and then the other two people I, I don't know. Uh, Julie, maybe you can identify the three people that I don't know. Yeah, I, I know them because we worked with them for years. I know the guy very well. Um, oh, um, the guy who's, sta who's standing next to you, uh, Jennifer in the green. Um, he is he is the he 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 is actually a PhD. Student candidate, um, and he's he's uh, he's uh, uh, he works for the Muse, uh, Comfort Women Museum, and he worked with us very very closely. His name is Darcy, and the person next to him is also um, uh, one of the people that as well as I did hear talking about there. The person next to Phyllis, uh, uh, in between Phyllis and Lillian, is the uh, chief curator of the uh, Comfort Women Museum. And we've communicated with him. We knew who he was, but I didn't. And I didn't. But I also um, uh, get to meet him and Darcy uh, for the first time. 
at this trip. So it was really wonderful. You know, so long. And we finally get to meet with them. It was like old friends finally seeing each other and we know how each other's habits and you know, and uh we 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 survived some challenges together and but it was just wonderful. So yeah, yeah. I Yeah. The, the, I I just like love, love the idea of like people uh being able to do this, especially since now like we all are, you know, this uh event right now that we're this panel is kind of co-sponsored by a bunch of different peace groups, um, from uh Pivot to Peace and Veterans for Peace to China Working Group to you know Chow Collective. So like this is something that like, almost anyone can do, especially now that there's more direct flights, there's like a little bit easier access to visas to go and kind of see. And also I I like what you said earlier, Julie, about um the way China's commemorating its history and like the suffering that they that Chinese people experienced in the 20th century when it came to colonization. And I think it kind of serves as a prescient um reminder of why, you know, people there understand the gravity of war and why it's it, it is not something that is, you know, to be taken lightly. It's not like a cavalier issue. It's something that really affects people's survival, human security, the vulnerable and the marginalized. Um, and before we kind of close out the hour, I just like to ask both of you, what, um, based on your travels to China, uh, what experience um, and I guess, advice would you give to people or you would you share with people who care about you know reaching a peaceful future where china and the united states aren't are not at the brink of war i think the first thing is that people uh, need to educate themselves about what these situations really are and if you just read the mainstream you know us or western or allied news you get a really skewed picture uh, there's a lot of half truths and there's a lot of even outright lies, um, you know. Um, so you really need to look at uh, news media, not just from the American or allied or Western sources, but if you go to, if, if we're challenging any country, I would suggest that people search for news media from the country that's being targeted read their side of the story. You know, uh, the US frequently says, you know, for example, that uh, China or Xi Jinping is threatening to invade Taiwan. That's really a distortion of what they actually say. China has not share, changed its position in 50 years, which is that they want eventual peaceful reunification with Taiwan, no time frame named, and war would only be a consideration if Taiwan were to declare independence. So China has not changed its, its position, but you wouldn't know that by listening to the American mainstream media. What you need to do is actually go to the Chinese media, and they have English, um, and look at, for example, CGTN. Um, CGTN frequently will show you the actual uh, 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 foreign, uh, foreign <laughs> Affairs Office statements, and you actually see the foreign minister or Xi Jinping or other high officials making statements about Taiwan. You can see what they actually say. You could listen to the voice of the translator. You can hear it firsthand. Uh, same thing with Chinese media. Um, you know, you could, you, 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 you can go on YouTube, you can see Americans who live in China posting videos about their life in China. You can see what it's actually like. Um, you don't have to take America's uh, mainstream media word for it or American officials word for it or anonymous security intelligence sources or this kind of thing. Go to the mainstream, go to the media of the country that's being targeted, whether it's China, whether it's Nicaragua, whether it's Haiti, whether it's, you know, Iran, whatever, read both sides of the stories, watch their videos, and also go to neutral countries like Singapore, 
CNA is one of the uh, mainstream media uh, of Singapore, you can go to CNA and see on YouTube and see what they say. Um, that would be my suggestion. Thanks, Michael. I, that kind of really corresponds with what we have been doing at the China en is not our enemy campaign when it comes to disarming the discourse and really focusing on identifying the ways in which violence and you know anti-China hate and hate against uh, other countries is kind of invoked in our public discourse and you know questioning that and putting peace first when we talk about um, foreign policy. And uh, Julie, uh, yeah, I, I'd like you to share, especially as someone who you know you've had experience in you know working in the education system, working in the judicial system here in the United States. What's your uh, takeaways, and what what advice would you give to you know peace activists who want a different relationship between China and the U.S. and how they should fight for that? Yeah, uh, first of all, let me just say that it really pains me whenever I read that um, how many percentage of American uh, adults view negatively of China. And I think the latest number is like 83%. Uh, it really pains me as a Chinese American, because I know that it should not be that way. It could not be that way. Um, there's just no reason why people should view China negatively. Um, and um, uh, China has not uh, started any war with us, has not provoked us in any way in trade or anything like that. Uh, they made me some mistakes here and there, but it's so credible, and uh, these things can be dealt with diplomatically. And all the information that um, that uh, and uh, that make people uh, become negative towards China, are uh, based on ignorance and and mis and disinformation. I mean, look at the the spy balloon. They still call it a spy balloon. A year later, General Miley, maybe less than a year later, General Miley admitted it's not a spy balloon. He didn't really even say that. He could not bring himself to say it. But he says no spy apparatus in that balloon. So he could not have spied anything. So it is not a spy balloon. But even today, they still talk about spy balloon. So that's a kind of um, uh, disinformation that is purposefully spread, unfortunately. Once you spread that information, it's really hard to bring it back. I think that we just have to work really hard. Sometimes, you know, I feel like saying, oh my God, you know, all the work that I'm doing, am I making a difference? And I always worse. <laughs> so we have to keep working at it. And I urge all the people who are watching this program, you must be an activist in your own rights. Otherwise, you would not be watching this program. And if you're just curious, you know, try to help coping, do their work uh, even better. I think about coping something as well. And they have an excellent program called China is Not Our Enemy. Whenever I use these words with my own, with my Chinese friends in, in San Francisco, they all love this. Yes, China is not our enemy. Please, please, you know, keep working on it. So I uh, just tell people, China is not our enemy. And when people, you know, challenge you, just say, talk about a spy balloon. That's a good example, okay? <laughs> how they've been misinformed and how ignorance can engender war. You know, we've been in last week war here since the civil war. Uh, the January 6th is not a war. It's a one day, you know, disturbance is a riot or whatever you want to call it. It is not a war. But people in China have experienced horrific wars. The second world war. Then they have all the international cultural revolutions, right? And the war between the Kuomintang and the communists. They have experienced war. They don't want war. So we have not experienced war. Let's keep it that way then. Why are we feeling like so nonchalant? Hey, you know, let's go to war, you know, for some, some other people and not for ourselves. This is what we do. I think we just have to keep talking, keep engendering goodwill. And I think that we should keep organizing trips to China. Let them enjoy the Chinese food, enjoy the view, the beautiful, pristine uh, uh, sceneries and the, the optics and the geography. It is so wonderful to be in China and enjoy the humanity of China. The people in China are really kind people, very open to us. Exactly. I feel like people, the people exchanges are just so important in general. I mean, you know, uh, in my limited uh, time in activism and also in, in my capacity as a journalist, I've, you know, been to China, I've been to Cuba. Um, when I was in China, actually, uh, I had the, the um, you know, ability to speak with someone from uh, North Korea and 
our common language, the common language we spoke was Mandarin. And I was able to talk to them and have a jovial kind of conversation, which is, you know, uh, something I never thought I'd be able to do. Um, so I think the more we actually have these people to people exchanges, the more we realize, you know, how human security, how universal it is and how it's important and should be protected. And we can't allow ourselves to, uh, you know, be victims in this propaganda war uh, that seeks to make China or any other country our enemy. And uh, Grace just uh, dro dropped several of our actions and some of uh, some detailed information about uh, some of our members going to China and what they what they saw and what they experienced. A lot of their analysis. Uh, we really implore you to sign those petitions, especially. And we have one focusing on telling Biden to ditch the military spending bill. He's you know trying to push through Congress and instead strike a global climate finance deal um, with China, as well as one to stop Congress uh, or tell Congress to stop the hate um, from the anti-China committee, which has been, you know, uh, you know, uh, criticized by a lot of civil rights groups as stoking hate and, you know, increasing hate crimes against the AAPI community in the U.S. And so uh, there's lots of ways you can take action and there's lots of uh, great things we have on the horizon as well, where we can stand up and resist the pro-war uh, propaganda that is all too common uh, coming from Washington, D.C., coming from the media and other places. And this is such a great forum where we can listen to peace activists like Julian and Michael, who know what they're talking about and have their heart in the right place, which is uh, planet and people first. So I'd just like to say thank you so much, Michael and Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>